Good evening and welcome. This is Prime Time News on TV1. I'm Jayamal Ratnaika for the News First Team. On to your lead story for the day. President Gotabe Rajpaksa inquired about the possibility of assigning a greater percentage of the orders of supplying school and military uniforms to local manufacturers from next year. This was during a visit to the industrial estate in Dangkotua this morning. The president has stated that large-scale and small-scale local manufacturers should immediately start producing high-quality fabrics. According to a statement issued by the president's media unit, manufacturers stated that several companies that were started with a large infusion of capital had to be closed down due to the coupon system implemented for school uniforms. The president encouraged the management of these companies to resume production of textiles as soon as possible and instructed them to look into the possibility of providing school clothing-related materials to those who are engaged in self-employment. The president is of the view that the cost incurred on imports can be reduced by 68 percent by increasing the production of textiles locally. Meanwhile, the president has instructed that steps be taken to increase the production of national and Buddhist flags to meet the demand required by the country. Since our inception, News First has continued to act as the voice of the people by reporting stories on their behalf. This is one such issue faced by the people. Defined as provision of financial services to low-income people by the central bank, microfinance services were designed to reach excluded customers, usually poorer population segments, who are incapable of producing collateral to obtain debt under conventional methods. As defined by the central bank, the aim of microfinance is to improve the lives of low-income earners by helping them become self-sufficient. However, as of late, questions have been raised regarding the demerits of such financial services. At present, thousands of Sri Lankans across the island are suffering due to their inability to repay the loans obtained from micro lenders and other informal lending institutions. A majority of these individuals have obtained loans under the basis of short-term repayment, usually on a monthly, weekly or daily basis. According to the Lanka Microfinance Practitioners Association, data gathered from 37 microfinance institutions in 2018 indicates a total loan portfolio of 94 billion rupees for over 2.8 million active borrowers, of which over 2.4 million were women. These MFIs also serve over 2.4 million depositors and hold deposits to the value of 33 billion 249 million 899 thousand 424. Why? We paid about seven or nine installments. We obtained 45 thousand rupees. However, we have to pay around 60,000 rupees even after settling seven installments. They do not offer reasonable interest rate. We are running out of money to pay the lenders. More than 400 people in the villages of Singhapura, Shantipura, Chandanapukuna have obtained microfinance loans, but most of the women have been badly affected due to this. We have paid attention separately towards those who have obtained microfinance loans and are unable to repay them and also towards those who are repaying them. If we pay attention only towards those who are repaying the loans, those who can repay the loans will not do that. We ensure that neither of the parties are affected. We have held talks with the finance secretary in this regard. We hope to appoint a committee in the future to collect the required data. This would include officers from the Treasury, the Central Bank, our Ministry and representatives of money lending unions. The people of the country are also facing issues regarding the prices of coconuts. The Consumer Affairs Authority is currently inspecting shops to observe whether coconuts are sold in line with the Gazette notification that has been published recently. Teams of Consumer Affairs Authority officials inspected several shops in Dean's Road in Colombo today. <laughs> The government must give us coconuts at their expense to sell them to consumers. We can sell coconuts at a cost of 60 or 65 rupees only if we can purchase them at a low cost. 
Are you the one supplying coconuts to Maradana? For how much do you sell them? Is it 75 rupees? The government has ordered that it has to be sold below 70 rupees. We can understand your issue. However, the government has introduced this as a law. Shouldn't you work in line with the law? Are you trying to go above the law? The people must work in line with the rules. Our cameras captured the manner in which action was taken against traders selling coconuts at high rates. They had been selling coconuts at rates as high as 75, 80 and 90 rupees. Complaints have been made against them stating that they do not purchase coconuts from wholesalers. We will inquire into those who distribute these coconuts and explore the possibility of taking legal action against them. If it's an individual or a joint partnership, the fine will range between 1,000 and 10,000 rupees. If it's a company, the fine will range between 10,000 and 100,000 rupees. The Consumer Affairs Authority said that legal action had been taken against 56 traders for selling coconuts above the stipulated rates. Those who criticize the fuel price formula are now introducing a formula to calculate the price of coconuts. They are going to provide traders and consumers with a wooden gadget to measure the circumference of a coconut. Look at what has befallen this country. The people of this country have to purchase coconuts by measuring them. Therefore, I bought a coconut today. Let's measure the circumference of this coconut. This measures 13 inches. If this is 13 inches, how much will it cost? It is supposed to be sold at 70 rupees. I saw one person saying that a coconut of this circumference had been sold at 85 rupees. The government has lied to the people on this occasion as well. These individuals who cannot introduce a price for coconuts told the people to consume dal and corn. Tomorrow they might ask the people to eat grass instead of vegetables. This is the type of government that we have. <laughs> In future, a minister in Sri Lanka might be able to commence a business of importing measuring tapes from China so that it can be sold to us when visiting shops. Otherwise, they can issue a circular stating that coconuts must be sold in the vicinity of tailor shops. That is because a tape is needed to purchase coconuts. No government has acted in such a hilarious manner. All units of measurement were changed in the 1980s. Length is measured in centimeters and meters. However, the gazette includes inches. So if we measure the coconuts in inches and if someone violates the rules, you cannot take any legal action against such wrongdoers as the accepted unit of measurement is in centimeters and meters. This shows that those who drafted the gazette are not even aware of the accepted units of measurements. <laughs> I am not aware as to whose idea this was. You do not need such mechanisms to measure coconut. When you hold the coconut, if it is relatively large in size, it should be sold at 70 rupees. While the smaller ones could be sold at 60 rupees. There is nothing much to it. You do not need a price formula for that. <laughs> Steps have already been taken to control the price of coconuts. What is required is to increase coconut production. We are aware that there is a small issue regarding the Gazette notification. We will look into the concerns raised about having to take a measuring tape to the market to buy coconuts. While the suffering of the citizenry of Sri Lanka continues to intensify day by day, the 20th Amendment to the Constitution has taken center stage in the political arena. By this evening, 39 petitions had been submitted to the Supreme Court with regard to the amendment. Chairman of the Youth Wing of the Samik Janabalaweke, Mayantadisa Naikas, submitted a petition against the 20th Amendment with the Supreme Court today. We have complete trust in the Supreme Court and the justice system. We are hoping a judgment will be passed against the 20th Amendment and the courts will protect the democracy of the country. General Secretary of the United National Party, Akhile Viraj Karyawasam, and the party's deputy leader, Ruan Vijay Vardhana, submitted two petitions as well. Our court correspondent confirmed to News First that member of the National Election Commission, Ratna Jeevan Hool, and the Sri Lanka Press Institute submitted petitions today against the 20th Amendment. The People's Lawyers Association challenged the 20th Amendment as well by submitting their own petition. Api Karunudakpa City, Visiona Sansodening, 
We pointed out facts regarding the loss of fundamental rights. We hope the Supreme Court will deliver a positive response in the future regarding this petition. A five-judge bench was appointed by Chief Justice Jayanta Jayasuriya on the 25th of September to consider the petition submitted against the 20th Amendment. A five-judge bench led by Chief Justice Jayanta Jayasuriya would also comprise Supreme Court Justices Bhuvanikali Vihare, Sisere De Abru, Priyanta Jayawardhana and Vijit Malal Goda. <laughs> If the two centers of power created by the 19th Amendment are maintained in the same way, the President may try to do something and the Prime Minister can come forward to block. Even the Prime Minister will not be able to do anything if the President decides to get in the way. I believe that several members of the opposition will also come forward to support this. The government expects to present the preliminary draft of a comprehensive constitution to Parliament within six months. A committee consisting of nine experts has already been appointed and the work of that committee has already commenced. Can the President be sworn in as the Minister of Defence now because of the 19th Amendment? Is it fair to wait for another six months to resolve this situation? We are not ready to wait like that. Is the national requirement right now to switch power between the younger brother and the elder brother? That's the basic problem here. It is clear that the 20th Amendment is not a provision for the well-being of the country, but an attempt to get personal gains. That's why we are of the stance that it should be rejected. If the President's will becomes the law of the land, we don't need a constitution. We will also not need the guidance of circulars. What the President wants will be the law. This is the most dangerous part. We should not leave an example such as this. When campaigning for the August 5th parliamentary election, we continuously sought a two-thirds majority to revise the 19th Amendment. The people have given us the mandate to do that. The United National Party that opposed that move received one seat, while the party that contested under the symbol of the telephone received the other seats. Ultimately, we won the election. This is the first time in Sri Lankan history that two-thirds majority has been won under the preferential voting system. Therefore, we will fulfill our promises to the people regardless of the circumstances. When Zia Jayawardhana drafted the constitution, he did not establish state institutions. However, state-owned companies were set up between 2000 and 2010. CPC Lubricants was established. Leco and Lanka Transformers Limited was set up as a joint venture of the Ceylon Electricity Board. Similarly, SLC set up Cricket Aid. They always challenge that they cannot be summoned to Parliament, arguing that we don't have a right to do that. Lanka Transformers Limited had even obtained recommendations from the Attorney General as well. Telecom refused to come to Parliament when Maitri Pala Sirisena's brother served there. Sri Lankan Airlines also informed Parliament in writing that they cannot appear in Parliament. We had the powers to summon them under the 19th Amendment. What have they done through the 20th Amendment? We have gone back to 1978. They have omitted provisions that require a suitable person to be appointed as Auditor General. Now anyone can be appointed to this position. It might be a person who is liked by the President or an ordinary man on the street. If they are not satisfied with this audit, they might appoint an army officer to the post. The 20th Amendment is a policy decision of the government. Every faction is bound to work with a proper understanding of its provisions. When the topic is up for discussion, anyone can present suggestions. They can either be accepted or rejected. The 20th Amendment will get passed. Just because the audit commission gets cancelled, it doesn't mean that audits don't happen. Either the Auditor General or a reputed audit firm must conduct audits annually. The Parliament Corp Committee can convene anyone based on its report. <laughs> A major discourse has arisen over the 13th Amendment and the 20th Amendment to the Constitution in the country. While diverse views are being expressed regarding this matter, the 13th Amendment had figured during a discussion between the Prime Ministers of India and Sri Lanka last Saturday. 
The 13th Amendment to the Constitution was introduced after the Indo Lanka Accord had been signed in 1987. This amendment, that sought to resolve many issues through the devolution of power, saw the birth of provincial councils. The topic of the 13th Amendment had figured during a discussion between Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi over the weekend. <laughs> The government received a strong public mandate during the presidential and parliamentary elections. That mandate was granted to us to serve the people equally. Accordingly, we will create an environment in which the people of all communities can work in unity and with cooperation. We know that we will receive your support for that. We must state that the rights of the people have been given priority within the framework of democracy despite difficult circumstances. Regardless of how many hardships we face, we wish to remind that we will fulfill the economic and health requirements of the people. I feel that is wrong. I was also part of those discussions. I feel those are regarding 13 plus that came up in 2011. During our discussions about 13 plus, we spoke about an upper house in the legislature. At that time, I believe it was Manmohan Singh who brought up the matter of 13 plus and not the Prime Minister. I need to correct you on that. However, a joint statement issued on the meeting showed that the Indian Prime Minister had stressed the importance of implementing the 13th Amendment as essential for carrying forward the process of peace and reconciliation while working towards realizing the expectations of Tamils for equality, justice, peace and dignity. Both leaders also exchanged views on reconciliation in Sri Lanka. Prime Minister called on the new government in Sri Lanka to work towards realizing the expectations of Tamils for equality, justice, peace and dignity within a united Sri Lanka by achieving reconciliation nurtured by the full implementation of the constitutional provisions. He emphasized that full implementation of the 13th Amendment to the Sri Lankan constitution is essential for carrying forward the process of peace and reconciliation. Uh, the position of Government of India on this matter is well known. We have always stood for peace and reconciliation highlighted by our Prime Minister during the summit. According to the joint statement, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa had said that Sri Lanka will work to realize the aspirations of all the people, including the Tamils, by implementing the mandate and the constitution. I have repeatedly stated that the provincial council system that was introduced through the Indu Lanka Accord, given the political rights of the Tamils, must be implemented. The Sri Lanka government upholds a clear stance regarding this matter. The Indian government is also clear on its stance. <laughs> We do not uphold a different stance on that. We have a constitution. It was the Tamil parties that said that this is outdated. The government has accepted it. It is in our constitution.
சொல்றீங்க பதிவூரா சரத் நீங்க அதரோ கொடுக்கிறீங்க அரசியல் we discuss matters concerning the existing constitution we did not speak against that it is currently in effect therefore there is no suspicion about it sarath veera sekara has a different view while vigneshwaran has another those are personal views that is not the view of the government arasangathra herta adalla The Prime Minister spoke about this with his counterpart yesterday. The Indian External Affairs Ministry has issued a statement regarding the meeting. It states that the 13th Amendment must be implemented. Therefore, the Indian Prime Minister must meet Sarath Veera Sekar and discuss whether the 13th Amendment is required or not. Therefore, the 13th Amendment has been embodied in the Sri Lankan society. India has clearly expressed its views on that. Therefore, the government has to sort out that problem with India rather than with the Samagi Janabala Vege. Thank you, Dada. Moving on, the human elephant conflict has been a long-standing issue in the country. These issues have been highlighted continuously throughout our Gamma the Door to Door campaign that is currently underway for the fifth consecutive year. On a more somber note, two lives were claimed by a wild elephant attack yesterday, bearing testament to the existence of this problem. While wild elephants continue to destroy several villages in the country, we raised several warnings that the day on which elephants would enter Colombo would not be too far away. Api tamat maha sangvardhana vyaapriti kena kata karata tamat ratata gamata hariata aliveta kneha. News First had extensively reported on this issue on its news bulletins. Today, we provided the people in the metropolis a little taste of the daily lives of the people in the villages. This was the manner in which an elephant was taken through the Braybrook street as an exercise carried out by us. This unexpected encounter had shocked many people in the area. For thousands of years humans and elephants have coexisted peacefully but this peace has been disrupted by improper development activities and we've noticed that elephants and humans have developed this conflict that should not have been there in the first place so it's time that we rethink our place as humans and we rethink our approach to wildlife where we can build this coexistent that this coexistence rather which lasted for centuries This experience faced by the people of Colombo today is the reality in several villages. The lives of many humans and elephants have been lost as a result of this conflict. Hey, are you inna meda? Are you inna? Hey, oton are you inna poda mere inda? Two masons named Nimal and Piyadasa left their homes yesterday not knowing it would be their final journey. Their journey back home on a motorcycle was cut short at around 4 p.m. Nimal, Piyadasa and five others had faced an elephant attack while travelling from Devagiri area in Galgamo. Fortunately, three of them escaped. A correspondent reported that the victims could not be rescued immediately as the elephant had remained at the location for about an hour. The deceased victims have been identified as 40-year-old Nimal Vani Nayaka and 63-year-old EM Piyadasa, who are residents of Gallava and Nitalava. While the issue of wild elephants is constantly being discussed, environmental destruction is another topic which is highlighted on a daily basis. We continue to uncover facts about the great environmental catastrophes that are taking place in the country at present. This is the Chunna Khad reserve near the Veheragala Rajamaha Viharia in the Kantalay Sluis Canal area that falls under the purview of the Department of Forest Conservation. An organized group is destroying many valuable flora in the Chunna Khad reserve. The news first is in possession of visual evidence of the destruction. Nearly 200 plants in this forest reserve including Veera, Palu, Kaluwara and Kohumba have already been cut down. Area residents allege that more valuable plants have been uprooted deeper into the forest reserve. They also say that there are many endemic species of birds in this area.
Meanwhile, another forest reserve adjacent to this reserve has also been cleared. An area of nearly 60 acres has been cleared for paddy cultivation. The villagers point out that at least 1,000 varieties of plants have been cut down. Highly valuable ecosystems of our country continue to be demolished day by day. Against such a backdrop, this is what the minister in charge of the subject had to say about this destruction. I will not hesitate to punish. I don't care about any position. What's important to me is my country. I was given the ministry to protect Mother Nature. I will take the necessary action to protect her. We can see a rise of these cases when a government changes, but we won't let that happen this time. The reason they give is that it was allowed during the previous government. Why not now? We will not allow anyone in this government to do such destructions as in the previous government. The Colombo Stock Exchange hit a nine-month high today. Let's take a look at an update from the capital markets. The all-share price index increased by 2.89% to 6,028.20, 169.16 basis points higher compared to the end of last week. The S&P SL20 gained 0.55% or 13.64 basis points to close at 2,495.72 today. Market turnover was recorded at 1.9 billion rupees. For today, market closed nine months high. Market participants are mainly on the counters on the banking counters and the non-banking counters such as capital good material. The government offered 75 billion rupees of treasury bonds at today's auction, out of which only 32.6 billion rupees were sold. Bids worth 59.3 billion rupees were received for the 45 billion treasury bond issuance at 5.75%, 1.3 times of what was offered, while bids worth 34.3 billion rupees were received for the remaining 30 billion bond issuance at 5.35%, 1.14% of what was offered today uh, and it was uh, slightly influenced by last Wednesday's uh, bill auction which was only partly accepted and the balance was uh, funded through CBS holdings and with that uh, increase in uh, liquidity levels in the market was also another factor that influenced this week's bond auction out of the November 2022 bond auction 45,000 was offered however the acceptance level was uh, rather low we saw a spike in the the rates uh, compared to the market rates. Another 40 billion rupees worth of treasury bills will be issued through an auction tomorrow. On to a headline making story, former IGP Pooja Jasundra has revealed that he had passed on the foreign intelligence warnings of last year's April 21st attacks to all relevant police officials. He made these remarks at the presidential commission probing the bombings earlier today. In his testimony, former police chief Pujit Jayasundara said he had received a report on the 9th of April last year from the State Intelligence Service containing warnings of an imminent attack. The witness told the commission that he had forwarded this report to 1. Senior DIG of the Western Province Nandana Munasingha, 2. Senior DIG of the Crimes Branch and Special Task Force MR Latif and 3. The DIG of the Special Protection Range Varuna Jayasundara and had also contacted them over the phone about the same as well. The former police chief told the commission that he had contacted the senior DIGs of all provinces and had informed them about the matter. Jayasundara added that he couldn't share the information he had received on the activities of Islamist extremists by late 2018 as he had been barred from the National Security Council meetings. He conceded that the negligence of the police had assisted Zaharan Hashim and his group to avoid arrest. The witness added the SIS and the Criminal Investigation Department must be responsible for not enforcing the arrest warrant on Army Mohideen, a staunch member of the National Tawheed Jamaat group who is said to have been used as an informant. Responding to the commission, Jayasundara said that the CID could not use Army Mohideen as an informant without executing the arrest warrant on him. The President's Media Division has said that false information is being propagated on environmental destruction in the country since the new government came into power. Issuing a statement, the President's Media Division claimed that false reports are being published alleging that forest reserves are being set on fire and that deforestation is taking place. 
It added, these media reports imply that such level of deforestation never took place before and that the government is remaining silent in the face of these illegal acts. The PMD said that it was observed such reports are fabricated and contain false information. According to the PMD, false reports on such environmental destruction are propagated via social media as well as print and electronic media. It added that such false reports have been removed from social media after it was proven that they contained fabricated information. The PMD noted that opposition forces and their supporters have given high publicity to these reports by emphasizing on them during media briefings and other events. According to the statement, a private TV institution had published a false report on September 15 alleging that environmental destruction is taking place in Anuradhapura in relation to the refurbishment of the Ihalatalava Vava in the Mahavali H zone. According to the PMD, the news report claims that large-scale corruption is taking place in addition to environmental destruction. It added that the project manager in the Mahavali H zone had submitted proof to the Director General of the Mahavali Authority rejecting the media report. It insisted that necessary approval had been obtained to remove 80 mara trees as part of the project. The PMD noted that a private media outlet had alleged that massive deforestation had been taking place and had failed to provide accurate information to support its claims. It added that groups and individuals who purposely fabricate false news with the intention of misleading the public would be identified and the government has decided to take legal action against them. For the fifth consecutive year, our Gammadha teams travelled across several villages in Sri Lanka to lend an ear to the plight of those residing in rural Sri Lanka. Around 300 families in the Pollatha village in Minuangoda earn a living through the pottery industry. Although ample individuals are involved in this industry, the sourcing of raw materials has been an arduous task. The request of these individuals is to lift the restrictions that obstruct the process of obtaining raw materials. The individuals who Agam at the team met today have introduced a new water filter crafted out of clay. They are ready to supply the product if there is sufficient demand. Water sources in the Diddenia village in Hangwella are depleting due to large-scale mining occurring at rock quarries in the area. This village also lacks a maternity clinic, forcing mothers to trek three kilometers to attend a clinic in the Nirupala area. Adding to their woes are dilapidated roads that have posed severe transportation problems to the people. 250 families in Bridgewell Estate in Bogoantalava earn a living through the dairy industry. However, they do not have the necessary facilities to engage in livestock farming. Responsible officials have also turned a blind eye towards them. These farmers say that a litre of milk fetches them only 70 rupees despite toiling hard throughout the day. The village also lacks a place to dispose garbage. The request of these villagers is to provide them with cattle feed just as fertilizer is provided to farmers. They requested our government team to bring this issue to the attention of the authorities. Former United National Party parliamentarian Sujiva Senasingha has announced his decision to retire from politics. This decision had been announced in a statement issued under the signatory of former United National Party parliamentarian Sujiva Sena Singha's private secretary. The statement notes that Sujiva Sena Singha had decided to retire from politics after a 16-year career. It adds that the former parliamentarian would conduct himself independently following his resignation from politics. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, announced today that Father Dushanta Rodrigo will be appointed as the next Bishop of Colombo. The Diocesan Council had asked Archbishop Justin to select its next Diocesan Bishop in his capacity as Metropolitan of the Church of Ceylon. The Archbishop of Canterbury said, quote unquote, I congratulated him personally by telephone on Friday and I'm glad to declare my support for him publicly today. He added that Father Rodrigo had assured that he would give priority to enable the Church of Ceylon to take its proper place as a fully independent province in the life of the wider Anglican Communion. The new Colombo Bishop said, the people who are so diverse live in unity and that he is blessed to be a part of that life giving diversity. Father Rodrigo insisted, quote unquote, as we look to the next decade in the midst of new realities, our lives must reflect what God is doing in our midst at this point of time. He called on devotees to be grateful to God and exercise kindness among each other as it would help them move forward amidst several challenges. Veteran actor Tennyson Kure passed away this afternoon. He was being treated at the Colombo National Hospital at the time of his demise. 
Tennyson Kure, who had won hearts of countless fans as a comedian, passed away at the age of 68. He started his film career in 1986 with the film Perilicario. Brad Daniel Daval Miguel, Cherry O'Darling, Colom Pure, Parliament Jokes, Somi Boys were some of his timeless classics to which he has contributed with his acting. Tennyson Kure has acted, directed, written and produced many films as well as stage plays. Relatives of the deceased stated that details on the last rites of the veteran actor will be announced later on. And with that, it's a wrap of Primetime News on TV1. In case you missed any of these stories and much more, simply log on to our award-winning website www.newsfirst.lk and also our social media platforms on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. For the News First team, I've been Jarmal Ratnaik along with our sign language interpreter, Brian DeCruz. Take care, stay safe and good night.